about a year ago, I returned to the Himalayas with a couple of my friends. We joined a small tour group for a month long journey with one week in Bhutan, two weeks in Nepal, and one week in Tibet. We began our journey in Bhutan, which is often called the last Shangri-La. After arriving in the country, we traveled to Punaka. This is the Panaka Valley. The large structure in the photo is the Panaka Zong, meaning Palace of Great Happiness. It was constructed in the 1630s. A Zong is a temple fortress built when there were still fiefdoms in the area. The fiefdoms were united into the Kingdom of Bhutan in the early 17th century. In my opinion, it's the most beautiful Zong in the country. It's now the winter home of the chief abbot who is the head of the Buddhist religion in Bhutan. The main courtyard of the Zong is where the local people would gather when the area was under siege by another warlord. As you can see, the main entrance to the temple is very elaborate, and this is pretty traditional for um, the style in, in Bhutan. This is one of the many paintings on the walls of the temple. It's often seen in many other temples throughout the Himalayas. It portrays a social and environmental harmony. The partridge on the top finds and plants a seed, the rabbit waters it, and the monkey fertilizes it. And once the seed begins to grow, the elephant protects the tree for all to enjoy the fruit. You're not going to see many pictures of the inside of the temples tonight because photography wasn't allowed in most of the temples, unfortunately. This is the bridge we used to exit the, exit the temple fortress. There are many stray dogs in the area. The Buddhists do not believe in killing any living thing, including insects. But I'm sure if they had mosquitoes, they'd probably feel differently about that. Uh, so there is no dog population control in the country. After the restaurants and shops close for the night, they feed the leftovers to the dogs who run around all night barking and then they sleep all day. As I was walking by, I really wanted to wake them up for, as some payback for disturbing my sleep, but I restrained myself. We met this monk outside the Zong, and through our interpreter, we talked to him uh, for a while, and he told us that he had walked for 30 miles from Mountain Village to make his annual pilgrim pilgrimage to the temple. This is a photo of the Zong at night. The next morning we departed for the 10,000 foot Dakula Pass. Uh, along the way we saw prayer flags everywhere, which is, which is very common in, in many parts of, of the Himalayas, but especially in Bhutan. The Buddhists believe that the prayers on the flags will fly around the world with the wind. This is a small roadside shrine with prayer flags and small offerings. The prayers on the flags are repetitive, as you can probably see. The most common prayer 
is Om Mani Padme Om, Hum. This translates to Hail to the Jewel in the Lotus. There are over 108 stupas at the top of the pass, built by the Queen Mother to honor the soldiers killed in the war with the Indian insurgents in 2003. This is the Buddha Dornenme statue built by the Chinese benefactors for a hundred million dollars and completed in 2015. It overlooks the city of Thimpu, the capital of Bhutan. It is, and it's one of the largest sitting Buddhas in the world. It's made of bronze and gilded gold. This is, a, this is a picture of the current king and queen that is located at the junction of two roads on the way to the capital. He was crowned in 2008 and is known as the Dragon King. The country is a constitutional monarchy, monarchy uh, very similar to Great Britain and has a population of about 700,000. Western countries use the GDP, the gross national product, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, to determine how well they're doing. The father of the current king created the Gross National Happiness Index in 1972 to help guide the country in its decision making, obviously to keep the people happy. The people do seem happy, and so it must be working. The Bhutanese people are shy but they believe very strongly in procreation as part of their culture. And they like to advertise it, as you can see here. <laughs> I think this has something to do with the happiness index. <laughs> oh, dear. This is a stupa with Buddha eyes, which is a very common Buddhist symbol throughout the world. The Rinpong Zong was built in the mid 1600s. Some of the scenes from the 1993 movie Little Buddha were filmed here. This is the entrance to the main temple. And unfortunately, we couldn't take photographs inside because it, really, it was really quite beautiful. So the next morning, we started our trip to the tiger's nest, which is something I was really looking forward to for a long time. We departed Prow which is at 7,000 feet where we stayed the night before to start our, our climb, which was at 8,500 feet. This photo was taken shortly after we started to climb. When we reached this point, we were about halfway to the monastery. This is a prayer wheel and inside it is a roll of very thin paper with repetitive prayers written on it. Every time the wheels turn, thousands of prayers are said. Here's something for the bird lovers. <laughs> we saw several of these yellow-billed magpies as we climbed to the top. There are over 800 different varieties of birds in, in Bhutan. We finally reached the tiger's nest at 10,500 feet. It took us two and a half hours to get there. I was glad I had trained for several weeks before I left for the trip. The climb was difficult, but the 2,000 foot change in elevation was the hardest part of it. 
So starting off in the morning at, at 7,000 and going to 10,500 feet was, was uh, took your breath away. <laughs> Oh, I should say, I should really back up a second. Um, the actual name of the monastery is Prao Taksang, which means Tigerous Lair. I have and, a quest question for you. What, yeah, sure. is, what is on the left hand side? Um, there's something linear. What is that? Something linear on the left side. Linear from the patio, the lowest patio up, there's something that's white that's linear. What is that? Oh, you mean that pole? Is that a pole? I, it's, a, I, it's a pole. Okay. There's a, there's a bell on top of it, I think. Okay. See, we didn't actually, we went up this, this far and took a picture. If you actually wanted to go inside the monastery, you had to climb down 500 steps and climb up 500 steps, and then come back down 500 steps, and go up back, and go up 500 steps. So we didn't have enough time to do it, and we all wanted to do it, but there just wasn't enough time. Okay, so you didn't have to go into the... No, we didn't, and in most of it's closed now. Um, for a long time, it was an operating monastery, but um, over time, um, not many monks wanted to live there. And so they've closed off a lot of the monastery and turned a lot of the rooms into temples. Okay. It would have been hard to get supplies here. Yeah, that, that too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's see. So as I was saying, um, Protak Sang means the tiger's lair. Uh, as legend has it, a famous guru flew on the back of a tiger's to the site, giving it the name Tiger's Nest. There are several caves in the back of the monastery where the guru meditated for three months before building the monastery in 1692. It's, be, it's been repaired several times since. It actually burned about 15, 10, 15 years ago. And part of it burned and they had to rebuild it. And they actually constructed a, a set of cables to bring uh, equipment over as opposed to trying to do it all all by hand. So the next day we we flew to Kathmandu in Nepal. This picture reminds me of how the old city looked in 1971. Uh, not much has changed here. The city center um, has narrow streets and get very crowded. This is pretty typical of, of the major part of the, of the city. When you go out to the suburbs, it, it's a lot different now. Obviously, the cities have grown over the years. It's about 10 times bigger than when I was there. So the next morning, we drove about 20 minutes to go to Bhaktapur to see Dubar Square. Uh, this is a UNESCO heritage site, which did not experience as much damage from the 2015 earthquake as other parts of the area. Many of the old temples in Kathmandu were destroyed and may never be rebuilt because of the cost. This is Nai Naitopola Temple. It is the tallest and largest temple ever built in Nepal. It's five stories high and took three generations to build it. This is a close up of the temple guardians. And you can see how much design detail went into creating these, these statues. These are other temple guardians um, that, are, that are very artistic. There are several other temples, but I, th I think these two had the most interesting guardians.
this beautiful old building in, in Dunbar Square is protected by lions, which is a very popular symbol in Nepal. This is the Kamari or living goddess of the Buddhist people in Nepal. About 90% of the country is Hindu, but still many of those worship the Kamari. She looks exhausted after blessing many people with a short prayer and placing a red spot on their forehead. You can see this is a tough job for a five-year-old. <laughs> uh, the goddess is appointed at a very young age, usually between three to six years old. She retires when she has a first period. The Kamari is always chosen from the Shakaya community of gold and silversmiths in Kathmandu. There's a long list of criteria that's used to select the new goddess. It's primarily based on health and beauty. She became a Kamari in 2017 at age three. The next morning we took a flight along a stretch of the Himalayas that had many of the tallest peaks in the world. The pyramid shaped mountain on the left is Mount Everest, which is over 29,000 feet tall. After the flight, we departed for the Annapurna range of the Himalayas to go trekking for several days. But on the way, our guide noticed there was going to be a wedding in the village that we were passing through. He stopped and he asked if he could come inside to see the women, the women's celebration that occurred before the wedding. And it was difficult for, there was, on this trip, there was only six of us. Um, I'm sorry, no, there was more than that. There was 12 of us on, in, in Bhutan but there was only about five guys. And so because there were so few guys, they were willing to let us in. And the women would sing and, and, and dance to celebrate the upcoming event. The men have a similar celebration, but it's heavily focused on alcohol. This was our lead guide for the four day trek in the mountains to visit local villages. He's led trekking ex expeditions in many parts of the Himalayas, including to Mount Everest Base Camp. You can see here that he has a large chest to accommodate his large lungs, which allow him to breathe better at a high altitude. Jim, did you have any trouble breathing? Um, when we went to Nepal, no, no problem. Um, other than when we went after the tiger's nest in, in Bhutan because we got up high. Once you, once you get acclimated, um, it's not that difficult, but it takes a while to get acclimated. So um, because of the fact that we had some time and we started off at about probably 5,000 feet and worked our way up to 7,000, in, in Bhutan, it was just that last day where we went from 7,000 to 10,500, and that was a little tough breathing. But I'll tell you more about that later when we got up to uh, 12 to 16,000 feet. <laughs> All right. These were three of the six porters that, that carried our packs wrapped in plastic to protect the bags from the rain, which it did quite often. Each straw basket weighed about 75 pounds, and this is how the women carry everything in the, in the mountains. The women were very happy to have the opportunity to work as porters since jobs are very scarce in the area. In fact, many of the men in the villages work in other countries to earn a living. This is one of the many beautiful views of the Annapurna Range that we saw on our treks. And this was on our, our trek to the lodge.
This is where we stayed for three nights. It wasn't fancy, but it was my favorite place we stayed on the trip. The service was great, the food was good, and the views were amazing. Every morning, they would wake us up at 5.30 a.m. to see the sunrise. And they'd have coffee and morning snacks waiting for us to enjoy while the sun came up. Here is one of the sunrises. And here's another beautiful one of Fishtail Mountain. You can see the, it looks like a fishtail with a little um, notch in the, in the top of the mountain. Later that day, we hiked to a local school that served several of the villages. Whoops, sorry. I jumped ahead here, I gotta go back. I touched my mouse. It always causes a problem. Come on. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so later that, that day we went to a hike to a local school that served several of the villages in the area. And this was our assistant guide at the gate. It's a school with less than 50 children. The teacher in the photo was giving special attention to two of the youngest students in the class. The class only had about six, uh, about eight students in it. Then we hiked to one of the nearby villages. This is a pretty typical village in the area. And we had an opportunity there to talk to the locals and to have lunch. These ladies that were preparing our lunch over an open fire just has, as the villagers have done for hundreds of years. Would anyone like to guess what this lady is doing? Uh, you can hold your, or your answers if you want to, your guesses if you want to until after the program. Um, if people need to unmute themselves, they can do that if they have a specific question. Um, they can unmute themselves and then remute themselves. Okay. We spent some time with the matriarch of the village and she was quite a character. She did a lot of talking, but our guy didn't do much interpreting. I, I could only imagine what she was saying. <laughs> this is the base camp for Annapurna One, the 10th tallest mountain in the world. The camp is at 13,500 feet. It takes six days to trek to the site and five days to go back. Since we didn't have much time, we took a helicopter tour to the base camp. We kind of cheated. You can see Annapurna 1 in the background. It's 26,000 feet high. We had an opportunity to talk to some of the people who had hiked up. And uh, one of the guys we talked to, he was in his 60s. He was a lawyer from Philadelphia. And he was telling us that um, he didn't want to hike down, so he was going to take the helicopter down. <laughs> this is a photo taken in the opposite direction with Fishtail Mountain in the background. 
There was another base camp where the people are hiking, but it was, it was destroyed last year in avalanche. Since Fishtail Mountain is a sacred mountain, no one is, allo is allowed to climb to the summit. It's about 22,000 feet high. The next day we began our, our, white water, our white water rafting journey on the Seti River. We rafted for a day and we stayed overnight at a riverside camp and visited nearby villages the next day. The following day we rafted again to complete our river trip. I wanted to take a photo of the raft going through the rapids, but I had to either paddle or take a photo. My rafting partners decided I should paddle. We spent two days in Chitwan National Park, which is located in the rainforest. Um, this is where they protect the animals. Um, we went on several safaris. The first one was in a canoe. And this is an Indian rhino along the riverbank. They look quite different than African rhinos with their layers of, of protection. We didn't get to see a tiger as we had hoped. The tiger was spotted in the area, but our vehicle got stuck in the mud before we could get there, <laughs> which ended our safari. But we did see a spotted deer. Now, the deer wasn't disturbed by the rhinos, since you probably know they're, they're herbivores. We then went back to Kathmandu for a day before traveling on to Tibet. We had an opportunity to see the area and city where cremations occur, as they have for thousands of years. We also had an opportunity to talk to one of the, one of the nearby shamans. They provide spiritual and physical healing to the local people. And that's, that's important at the cremation site. Then we flew to Hassa, the capital of Tibet, which is at 12,000 feet. This is a photo of the palace on the night that we arrived. Since we are going very quickly from 4,500 feet in Kathmandu to 12,000 feet in, in Hassa, we had to take altitude medication so we wouldn't get sick. You probably wouldn't need the medication if you had several days, probably four, five, six days to make the 7,500 foot elevation change. They had oxygen in the hotel rooms just in case you needed it, but you didn't want to use it because you would then need to acclimate to the altitude all over again and nobody wanted to do that. So we just kind of toughed it out. On the second day, we started to feel almost normal. Then we climbed about a thousand steps to the top of the Potala Palace. It was constructed in the mid 1600s and was the winter home of the Dalai Lamas for more than 300 years. There are over a thousand rooms and 10,000 shrines in the palace. It's it sustained only minor damages during the Chinese Cultural Revolution in 1966, unlike many of the other temples in the country which were badly destroyed. The Chinese government has paid to restore some of the other major temples, but there's many temples throughout the country that the local people have been trying to reconstruct with their own money. Tibet was incorporated into China in, in 1950. This is the main entrance to the, this is the entrance to the main temple on the top of the palace. Um, unfortunately, once again, we couldn't take pictures inside, but there was some, it was very beautiful. Also on top of the palace 
are many prayer wheels that the Buddhists spin as they walk counterclockwise around the temple wall. We were fortunate while we were there to have the opportunity to watch the animated novice monks debate Buddhist teachings. And they really got into it and seemed to really have a lot of fun. Uh, they do this every two weeks. It snowed the night before we left for the glacier lakes and the high mountains. It made a nice photo of the palace in the morning. This is a view from about 15,000 feet overlooking Yamtrak Lake. It's the largest glacier lake in the area. When we when we got down to the lake, they were offering yak rides, and uh, I was really interested in that opportunity. Here you can see another glacier lake that was a little over 16,000 feet. It appears to be a good location for, for the prayer flags due to the strong winds. This is Guyancy, a typical small Tibetan town. We then drove to a, a nearby village, and this is one of the nicer houses in the village. It has a very unique artistic covering on the wall of the house. We also saw it on the exterior of most houses in the village. It's made from yak dung. <laughs> this is being, this is how they dry it for fuel. It's removed and burned during the winter. We left the, vid the village to drive to Gyansi, to the Gyansi Zong and monastery on the top of a hill. This is the expansive courtyard inside the Zong. This is one of the uh, temples that we actually go in. And this was the door that led to the inner chamber of the temple. This monk is preparing for a ceremony in front of the main Buddha in, in the temple. Um, I really don't know much about the ceremony. We didn't have a lot of time to spend there. I took this photo in 1971 and I included it not because it's a great photo, I know he cut off most of his head, but because it's one of the temples that was destroyed by the earthquake, by the earthquake in 2015, you can see how poorly it was constructed. And I'm sure this was older than many of the other um, buildings you saw at the UNESCO Heritage Site. That's it. If you have any questions or if you want to know more about the the altitude i think that was um yeah i think i we hopping and puffing i don't know that i'd be very good with the altitude jim it's a wonder you guys did i don't know how to unmute everybody I want to know what the lady was spreading. Oh, yeah. 
the uh Jim doesn't hear us. Jim's muted. Who's let's see. I don't know how to unmute everybody. So Jim looks like he's muted. Oh. Hey Jim, and there's school. Can you hear me? You have to unmute Jim. Most everyone is unmuted, but I know a few of us kind of stayed muted. Is there a command to unmute everybody? No, there isn't, but you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Unmute, here we go. Okay. Can you hear me now? We yes. can hear you. Yep. Okay. So did anybody have a guess on what that lady was doing? Not a clue. It looked like she was uh, putting uh, a new flooring down, <laughs> but I bet you that's well, not the answer. <laughs> that's kind of what she was doing. Uh, every, every day, she mixes up a batch of manure and water, and she spreads it on the porch, and that keeps off the critters. Ah. <laughs> Probably keep out everyone else, too, wouldn't it? Probably. <laughs> Probably not many guests come. <laughs> I have a question. Um, these temples, like the one that's on your ending slide, and of course we saw multiple images of temples, but they are all quite large. Who lives in them? This one was actually, um, it was a palace that was uh, built for the Dalai Lama's winter home. And they lived there for 300 years, as I mentioned. So it's full of lots of rooms. They used to have about 15,000 monks living here. And now there's just a couple of hundred. But I mean, they, um, they almost look like cities in and of themselves. Yeah, this is huge. It is a huge place. And some are, well, the, the first one I showed you, the, um, the first song, it's about 600 feet long and about 200 feet wide. Uh, but a big section is the open courtyard, so there's not as many temples and and rooms in it. But there's probably three or four temples, and I don't know how many rooms for the monks. Okay. Any other questions? And look, what's the altitude here? Where this in this picture? Oh, this was twelve thousand feet. This was by the time we got to the top, because we had to climb a thousand steps, it was almost thirteen thousand feet. But um, it was tough at that level until you got used to it for, for a few days. It was still, you couldn't, you weren't running around anywhere because we weren't there long enough to really get well acclimated. We could never get as, as we could never breathe as easily as the people who live there because they have extra lung capacity because that's how they're, that's how they're born. Um, and they also have muscles that can easily uh, operate with less oxygen. So when we got to 16,000 feet, we didn't do a lot of hiking, but we didn't, we did that after about five days. So it wasn't, it wasn't as difficult. But I can't imagine what it'd be like climbing Mount Everest. <laughs> we did have a, one evening we had a lady who had climbed Mount Everest and she's climbed most of the high peaks in the world. She was one of the first women, she was part of the first all women's group to climb Mount Everest. And, and she was telling us that um, they would train, they would go up to the base camp. And once they get to the base camp, they wouldn't climb right away to the top. What they would do is they would climb part way, and then come back down. The next day they climb a little bit further. The next day they come back down, climb a little bit further. And in over about two weeks, they felt that they were comfortable enough that they could go all the way to the top. Yeah. This last stretch where there's almost no air, it's so thin they have to wear oxygen. And the risk is if they don't have enough oxygen before they get to the top, they're not going to make it. So, uh, kind of was, a big one. Pardon? Kind of a big risk. It's a very big risk. And um, that was part of the problem they were having. I'm sure you heard about it. We were there during all this, um, all these people who were climbing up there and they were getting um, kind of stuck in a roadblock and they couldn't get to the top. 
and some people were dying because they couldn't get oxygen. They couldn't get down in time. But uh, what the government started doing is a problem is they started selling too many permits to go up. And if you go with a good guide and buy your permit, it costs $60,000 a person, but you can spend less money and go with the inexperienced guide and you're not going to be quite as lucky. <laughs> and then end up dead. Some of them did. And the inexperienced guys were also taking people up who were not experienced climbers. And that's what caused a lot of the trouble. That's why people were backing up. A lot of these inexperienced climbers didn't know how to get up there. Jim, what group did you, was this like an organized tour through a company? Yeah, it, it was through OAT, Overseas Adventure Travel. Okay. But it's not, it's not one of the most popular tours because it's a lot of work. <laughs> Sounds it. I, I recommend it to anybody. I think it's great, but you have to realize what you're getting into and you have to train for it. Yeah. Joe Hempstead, who's down in one of those squares, has done a number of OAT um, trips, haven't you, Joe? Yeah, I have. Good um, to see you, Joe. Par pardon me? Good to see you. Oh, you can see me. All I, I'm still seeing the end slide. Am I, do I have to do something different? Uh, yeah, you probably have to go up there and um, join. Well, we can see you, though. Yeah, we can see you. You should be able to see. We can't see all of us, so I don't think you. Oh, well, you know what? If you're in your ga gallery view. Um, yeah, does, well, anybody have, right. does anyone have any more questions for Jim? Because I, I did... I didn't get his very first sentence, but I did hit the record button so that um, we would have the show recorded. But I want to conclude with any questions for him before I hit the stop button. Anybody else have any questions for, for Jim on, the, on any of the slides or about the trip or whatever? No, but we appreciate him. Yeah, it was great. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was, thank you. It was my pleasure great doing it. Great presentation. Thank okay. you. I'm going to hit stop recording.